My mic on? There you go. Hello, hello. Glad to have you here. It's a beautiful time of the year. We are going to have a beautiful morning. Glad to have the school with us this morning that will be sharing music later in the service. Hope that at this time of year you are able to spend adequate time in the vineyards or orchards or at least enjoying the fruit thereof and the beautiful things that God has put us, put in our lives. There is a fellowship meal today and all are welcome to stay after second service. Fellowship Hall is on the opposite side of the building. Uh, we are blessed with the many wonderful opportunities in this church, many things that happen at once. We are praying today for our friends and our builders that are out in Montana this week and they arrived safely yesterday and uh, beginning construction on the Fort Peck Indian Reservation Church and Community Center uh, that is beginning tomorrow. So we are praying with those that are out there for that. Please look at your bulletin and the things that are coming up. There is a Daniel 11 study group meeting this afternoon at two o'clock in the Reese Chapel. So that was a very interesting meeting uh, last Sunday morning. And uh, for those that are preparing for our event later in October, as we study the different interpretations and understandings of Daniel 11, you can be part of that at two o'clock this afternoon. Divorce care begins on Tuesday. If you know anybody that could benefit uh, from this uh, group, you could let them know, connecting them with the church family, that'll be this Tuesday. Uh, there's a women's ministry brunch tomorrow at 9.30. And I know that many are looking forward to that. Also, uh, small groups are beginning in October. So if you haven't joined a small group, well, today's the first day that the groups are publicized to join. And you can join a group uh, online, and the information is in the bulletin. And we have a wide variety of groups to choose from. And this is a wonderful opportunity for our ch big church to feel like a small church and to uh, enjoy the family. Today begins our, our fall week of prayer. And we want to welcome Pastor Mark Howard here to the Village Seventh-day Adventist Church in Bering Springs uh, from the Michigan Conference, helping with personal ministries and the Sabbath School Department. He will be joined this week by Pastor Cameron DeVazier and Pastor Wes Peppers our guest speakers that will be here from evening to evening uh, this week in this room at 6.30. And that begins uh, tonight. Pastor Mark is sharing the message in our church uh, this morning. And uh, the first evening message will be this evening at 6.30. So we look forward to uh, joining there at looking how to reclaim the lost. And um, some of you have already begun praying for people we gave last week a sheet. You could write down five names, and we'll have more of those this evening. We all have friends. There's many of them in this county, people who have become discouraged or slipped away. And so this, this could really be one of the most encouraging and fruitful weeks of prayers that we've had, and we look forward to participating with you in that. This time, I invite each one to prepare our hearts for the worship and the blessing that heaven has prepared for us as we fellowship together this morning. Thank you. give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face forevermore. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful day. Lord, we thank you for our opportunity to be here. Lord, we ask for the Holy Spirit to fill this church 
Let us open our eyes and receive the message today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please remain standing for the first song, um, 358, Far and Near the Fields Are Teeming. You may be seated. Thank you and good morning. It is time for the other children that are in the sanctuary to come forward. Those that are on the front, I'm gonna invite you to be seated. It's time for our children's story. And we do have baskets in the front for those that are still in the audience. You can collect the lamb's offering on the way up. And Emily will have a story for you up here at the front.
Well, good morning, everyone. There's a lot of you here this morning. How many of you guys like to go visit family? I love to visit family. So the story I have for you is about my great-great-grandma, and she was living a long ways from where she grew up, because she grew up over in Ireland. That's where she was from. And she was living with her husband and her three young kids. And she, because travel was difficult back then, she hadn't seen her parents in a long time. So she decided to take her kids and go back to visit her family. So while she was there, she was staying with her parents, and they were having a lovely visit. And then something happened. They saw in the newspaper one day that a man had escaped from the jail in their town. And he was a very dangerous man. He had killed someone, and he was in jail for that, and he had escaped. And they knew that he was somewhere on the loose in their area. And so they were very scared because they didn't know what was going to happen. And they decided to pray and ask God to protect them. So they all knelt down, and they prayed and asked God to keep them safe while this man was in their area. And that evening, something else happened. Just as it was starting to get dark and the sun was going down, they saw this strange dog, and it came to their door, and it sat on their porch, and they tried to get it to go home, and it wouldn't go anywhere, and it was a big dog, and the kids were all scared, and they couldn't get it to go anywhere, so they just went to bed, and it stayed all night on their deck. And the next morning, it was still there, and it left just as the sun was coming up, and so they thought, well, that was kind of odd, but they didn't really think anything of it. And the next night, the dog came back. And so they tried to invite it in, and they tried to give it food, and it wouldn't come in, and it wouldn't go home, and so it stayed on their deck that night. And the next morning, it had stayed all night on their deck, and they thought that was very strange, and it left in the morning, and that went on for several nights in a row, and every night the dog would show up, and they didn't know what was going on, they didn't know who the dog belonged to, but they couldn't do anything about it. And then, a couple days later, they saw in the newspaper again that the man who had escaped had been captured and that he was safely back in jail. And so they thanked God for protecting them while he had been, you know, free in their area. And they never saw the dog again. That night it didn't come back. And they never found out whose it was. And they always believed that God answered their prayer. And he sent his angels in the form of a big, scary-looking dog to protect them. So... There's two things I want you to remember from that story. One is that when you pray, no matter how scared you are, Jesus always listens, and he will protect you and take care of you and answer your prayer. And the other thing is that sometimes the scary things are the things he uses to answer your prayers. The kids are all scared of the dog, but the dog was the answer to their prayer. So remember that Jesus hears your prayers, and he answers in the best way, even if we don't understand. So. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your care for us and that you always protect us and take care of us and that we can trust you even when we don't understand and even when we're frightened. Thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day and please be with us all as we go through this Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen. So those of you who aren't in the choir can go back to your seats and thank you for listening. Our offering today is for Michigan Advance Partners. As many as you know, that this offering supports eight aspects of the work of our church at the conference level, including evangelism, building programs, Camp Osabo, camp meeting, and education. In Christ Object Lessons, it says, we are to praise God by tangible service, by doing all in our power to advance the glory of his name. God imparts his gifts to us that we also may give and thus make known his character to the world. Under the Jewish economy, gifts and offerings formed an essential part of God's worship. The Israelites were taught to devote a tithe of all their income to the service of the sanctuary. Besides this, they were to bring sin offerings, free will gifts, 
and offerings of gratitude. These were the means for supporting the ministry of the gospel for that time. God expects no less from us than he expected from his people then. At this time, I invite our deacons to come forward as we collect our offering. Father God, we ask that you would take our tithes, take our offerings, take these monies that we have collected today and apply your blessing like you did with the fruit, with the uh, loaves and fishes and allow them to be multiplied to complete the work that you would have it to do. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name I pray.
scripture reading this morning is Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 17. Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 17. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand well, what the will of the Lord is. Share with you and bow before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning as your children, as your people called by your name. Thank you for the merits of Jesus that make it possible to come. We delight to come into your presence and we thank you. We pray for the outpouring of your spirit upon us. We pray that you'll be with Pastor Howard as he presents the word. Father, we pray that you'll forgive us where we fail. By nature, we're sinful and we pray that you'll forgive us and that you will cleanse us and make us new. Be with those that have requested prayer listed in the bulletin. We pray for the blessing of your spirit to work in each life, each case, according to your wisdom and your purpose. We thank you for these young people that are here to uh, help us in our praise to you, and we pray that you'll continue to bless our school. Thank you for the school system and for the work of your spirit through the teachers. Now, again, we pray for your blessing to rest upon us this morning. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
And all the people of God said, Amen. Wow, you can't not feel great after that kind of music to start out with. Amen? It was a blessing this morning. I am Pastor Mark Howard. I'm glad to be here this Sabbath morning uh, and also through this coming week. Uh, I serve as the Associate Director for our Sabbath School and Personal Ministries Department here in the Michigan Conference uh, along with the Director, Pastor Cameron DeVazier. And Pastor DeVazier and I are going to be here this week for the week of prayer along with Pastor Wes Peppers as well uh, talking a little bit about God's calling for us in these last days. Um, I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning, and I hope that you are too. There are so many things we have to praise the Lord about. I was thinking about that when the students were singing, the Lord bless you and keep you. How many blessings are, we have abundantly from the Lord? Uh, what a beautiful morning it was. Here we are in the presence of God, and we have a knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. I spoke last night to a campus group, and I asked them how they were doing, but I, I prefaced it before I asked them the question to just remind them that we have a Savior who stands even now ministering in our behalf. And then I asked them, how's your day going? Because how can your day be going when you know you have a Savior? How can it not be anything but fantastic? Isn't that true? But not everybody has the same knowledge of that Savior, and I want to talk to you about that this morning as we turn our attention to our message, which is redeeming the time. Before I do that, I'm going to kneel and ask God to bless our time today in his word, and I'll ask you to bow your heads with me as I do so. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Father, we are thankful to be in your presence this morning. We are grateful that you have cleared your schedule for us and invited us here into your house. Lord, we want to see you more clearly and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And Father, we hope that by beholding, as you promised us in your word, we may become changed into that same image. So Father, bless us to this end this morning, for we ask and pray it in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. I was um, listening to a sermon Pastor Joe preached, I think it was a couple weeks ago. Um, I don't remember what your title was, but I know the title for our week of prayer this coming week is Seeking the Lost. And Pastor Joe had built on, at least a good part of it, on the lost parables in Luke chapter 15, right? You have, the lost, uh, you have the lost sheep, and then you have the lost coin, and then you have the lost son. And uh, what's interesting to me is, and I really appreciated that message, by the way, is that if you go into the next chapter, which I want to do with you this morning, Luke chapter 16, there's a parable that Jesus shares that for the longest time to me was one of the most perplexing parables in the Bible. Luke chapter 16, and that's where we're going to start this morning. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 16, right there in the first verse. In fact, I'm going to have you go back to Luke 15 for just a moment because I'm going to draw a contrast here. Luke 15 verse 1, I want you to notice what it says. As Jesus is getting into the lost parables, it says in Luke 15, 1, then all the who? All the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes did what? They complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable. And that's what launches the lost parables is, is he was mingling with the lost and seeking to draw them to salvation. The Pharisees were finding fault with it. And so he goes into those parables. Now, when you get to the end of chapter 15, you come to chapter 16, verse 1, the Bible says, he also said to who? To his disciples. So now he shifts attention from the Pharisees who he's addressing with the lost parables, not that that didn't have anything to do with his disciples as well, but he shifts his focus in Luke 16, and, and I'm going to share the significance of that here in a moment. But let's Pick up there in Luke 16, 1. He also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward. 
and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can what? I want you to note something here. This is going to come to play as well. He didn't say give account of your stewardship so I can decide whether or not you will remain a steward. He says give an account because you're done. Uh, that needs to be clear as we, as we continue on here. At least for me, it was a piece that I needed to understand. Now look at verse 3. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do. That when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? So he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write down 80. So the master what? Now, we'll I'll, I'll unpack this a little bit, but this always confused. The master did what? He commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. Some translations say more wisely. And then Jesus says these words in verse 9, And I say to you, Make friends to yourselves by unrighteous mammon that when you fail, or the marginal reading is when it fails, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches. And there's a little more to it, but I just want to take that, and we're going to focus in on that this morning. So here's a man, he's a steward. He's in charge of his master's goods. He has a pretty, uh, uh, he, he, he has a lot of free reign in what he's doing. The master evidently doesn't, we don't get the idea the master's checked on him, in on him for some time. He has pretty much free reign to do what he wants with the master's goods. The master just wants to make sure they're being put to good use. But word comes to the master that this man is, the Bible says, wasting, squandering his goods. Now it doesn't tell us that he, whether he's doing this intentionally, like he's an extortionist, or it doesn't tell us whether or not he's maybe just careless or lazy. But in some way or another, he is not making the best use of his master's goods. The master finds out, and he calls him to account and says, I'm taking your stewardship away. But you're going to have to give an account to me. Now, what does the man do when the master comes to him and tells him that? He starts to weigh out his options, right? He knows his stewardship's done, so he, now he has to process what his options are. Now, I want you to draw, uh, note something here. Some, an important part of this whole lesson is that this steward, up until this point in time, was living for the here and now and giving no thought for his future. He was making no plans for the future. He was just taking his master's goods, whether, like I said, whether he was using them dishonestly or whether he was just being lazy. He was living in the here and now. How do we know that? Because there are two things he entertains right away. Two potential options. Well, there are no options for him, but they're potential. And that is that of digging, which he says he's not going to do that, and begging. Let me ask you a simple question. If you've been planning for the future, you have a decent savings account or retirement or severance or something, investment portfolio, you're not even thinking about digging or begging. 
right? You're going to say, I'm going to scale back for a little while while I look for a job. The whole idea he's thinking that digging or begging, that even comes into the equation, is communicating to you and me that he really has given no thought to his future up till this point, and now's the day of reckoning. He's like, whoa, I've got to think this through. So the digging is out, the begging is out. He needs to come up with a way to plan for his future fast. He has to redeem the time, as it were. And he comes up with an idea. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start calling all... Now, he's got a window of time before he has to clean his office out, right? And so he's going to call the people who owe his master. Calls one, he says, what do you owe? He says, I owe 100. What does he tell him to do? Give 50 and it'll be good. Now, he has the authority to do that still. It's not dishonest for the person to pay 50, although they could ask the question, which they don't, which will come into play in a moment. You owe 100, write down 50. Somebody else, you owe 100, write down 80. Now, he's going to collect these past due debts, and I suppose if you've worked in a business situation, you have past due debts, sometimes some is better than none. But in this particular case, is he advantaging his master at all? Yes or no? He's not helping his master out. His master just went from getting 100 to getting 50, from getting 100 to getting 80. So who is he giving the advantage to? Who's he benefiting? Yeah, himself, yes. He's benefiting the people who owe money. I mean, let me ask you, if the power company called you and said, look, your bill's $185, just pay $75. Woohoo! That's fantastic. It's not helping the power company, all it's sure helping me. And when he calls these people and says, look, you owe this much right down, and he cuts the amount, he's benefiting them, not his master. Why? Because by benefiting them, He's putting them into an obligation to himself. He's like, look, I'm out of the stewardship with my master. I can't, I'm done here. I've lost this job. But if I can now turn my attention to benefiting others, then they're going to owe me. Are you following that? That was his thinking here. That's why he did what he did. Notice again what he says in verse 4 and 5. I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. Who's the they? All the people he's benefiting. It's like, hey, you know when I helped you out? Look, I'm down and out. Now can you help me out? This is what he's thinking. Now the trouble comes in, the trouble came in for me with this master's commendation. Like, how's the master come and say, hey, good job. And I, thought, and, and I think, the, I think part of the more challenge, and this is going to come in as we discuss this, is we know in the parable who the master is, and we know who the house, what the household is. The master is God, and the steward, that's supposed to be us. And is God commending the person who acts dishonestly? That was always the thing that I challenged, that challenged me, that I wrestled with. Who, what is this commendation he's giving? But I want you to notice something in this parable. The master never, and I said this already, the master never offers him his job back. He was out of a job. He's not commending him in that way in this particular parable, that's a parable that says, hey, you know what? Come back and work for me. But he's commending the fact that at least the guy started thinking about the future, started being a little more wise and taking in the whole picture. And then Jesus makes the application, I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when it fails, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Now that's the application Jesus makes. And I need to clear, this is the other thing that, that I wrestled with is unrighteous. First of all, like is a Christian supposed to do anything unrighteous? Here's the Lord saying, hey, make friends through unrighteous mammon. And I wrestled with that. First of all, with mammon. How many of you use that word on a regular basis? Mammon is from an Aramaic word that means wealth or riches. That's all it is. So wealth or riches, and, it, and that isn't limited to financial wealth. It isn't limited to money 
or property. Wealth can go beyond that, especially in a spiritual realm. You can talk about the wealth of, it does include finances, it does include property, but it also includes maybe time and opportunities and talents and knowledge, things that we've been in trouble. Let me ask you this question. As believers in, the, in God, what have we been entrusted with? No, 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 that's a bad question. What haven't we been entrusted with? Or in the words of the Apostle Paul, what is it that any of us has that we did not receive? It's not a hard answer. Nothing. Everything we have is entrusted us by God. Whether it be wealth, like I said, wealth of money, wealth of time, wealth of talents. Now, unrighteous mammon, unrighteous wealth, that simply means that the time, the possessions, the talents are not, not inherently good or evil. They're not intrinsically good or evil. It depends on the use we make of them. And so Jesus says, as he tells the parable of this steward, he tells his disciples to follow the example of the man in the story, and he says, you make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, by your riches, by your talents, by your opportunities, that when it fails, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Okay, back to the story again. How did the unjust steward make friends for himself? Jesus makes the direct parallel. By, by seeking to use those talents to benefit them. Now we could read all kinds of things into this story, but the simple point is, in the story, the steward stopped thinking and living for himself and thinking about himself and for a moment decided to live to benefit others. And what Jesus is saying is, in how much more in the spiritual realm should you do the same thing? Especially in light of where we started with the lost parables. He starts out addressing the Pharisees and the scribes who were criticizing Jesus because he was trying to advantage the publicans and sinners. And so Jesus spoke the lost parables and then he turns to his disciples in chapter 16 and he says in essence, do not make the mistake that they're making. The scribes and the Pharisees have been entrusted with, with eternal riches for the benefiting of humanity and instead they're wasting it on themselves. Are you following that? And Jesus is saying that rather than living for ourselves, caught up in the here and now, as was the case with the unfaithful steward, we should be using every means and ability within our control to bless others and make friends for eternity. Now I'd like you to turn to that scripture reading of ours in Ephesians chapter 5. I think this parable is a perfect example of what this uh, verse is telling us to do. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. Ephesians 5, verse 15 says, See then that you walk circum <clears throat> pardon me, circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, and of course the young man was commended for his shrewdness or wisdom. Don't walk as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And the days being evil, that's not talking about moral evil as much. I mean, that could be included there, but it's talking about the fact that the days bring all kinds of trouble. There are, there are accidents that happen there are diseases and sicknesses. There are all kinds of things in life that don't guarantee us tomorrow. 
And so the Bible says we're to redeem the time. Interesting concept. I mean, you can't really ever get time back, but the Bible's saying here that almost like if, if there was a way you could, do everything you can. In fact, it says redeem the time, but in the New International, I like the way the New International Version translates this, it says making the most of every opportunity. You can't get lost time back, but you can decide today to make maybe make more of the opportunities that you have than you made yesterday. I can say that for myself. What can I do differently to make the most of the opportunities God has given me? To use that unrighteous mammon to upbuild God's kingdom. It's interesting to me, now redeeming the time in this concept, you remember when the steward, he sat down, in fact, he called those creditors and he said, sit down and write what? Do you remember the next word? Quickly. Sit down and write quickly. Why? Well, he knows he's out of a job. He knows it's not going to be much time. He's got this little window of time to make this happen. And he's going to redeem the time while he can. Sit down and write quickly. Now, let me tell you something, saints. I really believe it's time for you and I to sit down and write quickly and decide what we're going to do with our talents and opportunities. You know, I'm looking at the world and what's going on in the world, and it, this world is crazy. I mean, I don't even know where to start. You could talk with the politics. We could talk about uh, uh, political unrest. We could talk about the, 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 another hurricane hit and, you know, the natural disasters. Wherever you want to go, as the Bible says, the world is waxing old like a garment. I'm going to pass this up, and I want to, this is a picture of my family. Now, I, I have an extent, I have quite a sizable family. I mean, this, this is a picture of me and my four brothers. Beyond that, I have stepbrothers, and I have stepsisters, and I have half-sisters. But me and my four brothers always get together every year, at least at Christmas, at my mother's house. And this was taken a couple years ago. This is the oldest, that's Dan. Um... Next in line is me, and then my brother John, and then my brother Jim, and then my brother Ron, the youngest. Now, I'm looking at the things happening in our world today, and in, in, in light of that, you know, this last year going into the holidays, just before the holidays, my brother Jim received a call to the General Conference. Some of you are aware of that. He used to work here in the Michigan Conference. So he works for the General Conference. In fact, in the same department I work for now in the Michigan Conference, which is interesting. So Jim got a call to the General Conference, moved to Maryland just before Christmas. And then my brother John, there on the far right, he and his wife, uh, she's from China, had been working in China, they got married, they've been back in the States for a while, but decided that they're going to go back to China. And he moved to China in January. So he, I knew this was happening right after Christmas. He's moving to China. So my brother Jim moves to Maryland, my brother John's moving to China. I see all these things going on in the world, and I began to be impressed that this may be the last time we're really all together like this. Now I thank God that we're all in the church, but just because you're in the church doesn't mean you don't need hope and encouragement in the right direction. And the Lord just began to stir my heart this last Christmas to say, you know, I mean, we got to, and you see the rest of the family with the kids and the grandkids and things can get chaotic. You know, you get all, oh, my mom's got this little house and it's everybody's packed in there. And things can get really crazy. But I, I was impressed. I need to take the opportunity to just tell my brothers how much I love them, how much I'm praying for them, and just en encourage them to be faithful because the Lord's coming soon. Now, this laid heavy on my heart. And the holiday came and went, and I never did it. And I like to say it's because of the chaos and what have you, but I'm, I'm going to tell you what I think it really is. This is one of the burdens of being a pastor. Joe, you can relate to this. Andy, you can relate to this a little bit. No matter what you say, there's always a potential of being called preachy. So here, you know, you've got the family. It's the holidays. You're having a good time. We're going to sit down and get solemn. And I just picture the kids rolling the eyes. And oh, Uncle Mark's getting preachy again. 
So I didn't do it. Now, just two months ago, I was invited down to Ohio to speak at a camp meeting. There's an Amish church plant in northern Ohio. It's awesome. These, this Amish community, and they're all, you know, studying and learning and becoming Seventh-day Adventists. And so I went down to speak at this camp meeting. I've been scheduled for this for a while. It's about, I went and I stayed with my mom. She lives in central Ohio. And the place I was speaking was about an hour and a half north, so I figured I'd stay with her and I'd go up and, and back to the, to the campground. It's a five-hour drive from where I am in Michigan, and so I got in the car about noon to leave. I was going down on a Thursday. I spoke on Friday and Saturday, Sabbath. So I got into the car, and as I got in the car, my wife says, your mom just called, and she wants us to pray for your brother Dan. He's going to the hospital to have some tests run. Now, I knew Dan had been having some migraines earlier that week, and then he had a high fever, and it wouldn't have been so bad if Mom wouldn't have had to bring up in the conversation we'd had earlier that, you know, your grandfather died of a brain tumor. <laughs> so then you start, thanks, Mom, and then you're conjuring up all this, well, you know, ho hoping against hope there's no problem like that, but I knew he was being checked into the hospital. And so I drove the five hours, got my family dropped off at my mother's, and I headed over to the hospital to see my oldest brother, Dan, when I got there, he was having this intense pain in his leg. It ended, be, ended up being caused by a, uh, a blood clotting he had going on. So I stayed there at the hospital Thursday night until they got his pain under control. And then I prayed with him and said I'd check back in on him in the morning. And of course, in the morning, that afternoon, I was going up to speak. Actually, that morning, I was going up northern Ohio to speak at this camp meeting. Well, I got a call overnight from my sister-in-law, and she says, you know, your brother Dan, she says that Dan was diagnosed, she didn't say your brother Dan, she said, Dan was diagnosed with leukemia, and they've transferred him over to the OSU Cancer Hospital. I mean, just, you know, overnight. So, in the morning, I headed over to the OSU Cancer Hospital, and my brother's pain was gone that he dealt with the day before, but he couldn't see anything. Apparently, he had developed some swelling on the brain and some bleeding. And the doctor said, you know, the, the, his vision, and of course, he was freaking out like, we're, you know, I can't see anything. They said, should be fine when we bring the swelling down. It's not something we're alarmed about, et cetera, et cetera. We just have to run some tests today and what have you. I was glad he wasn't in pain. So I went up north. I spoke. I came back from speaking. I called up. I was going to go by the hospital. Sister-in-law said, don't worry about it. I mean, he's been on medication all day. So he's been getting his rest and and they've just been running tests and everything is the same. They're just trying to keep him stabilized. Oh, I didn't mention this. So when they told me, when they told us that morning, I went to the hospital and they said, yeah, he's been diagnosed with acute promyelitic leukemia. So I look it up on Wikipedia on my phone and one of the things it mentions is it calls it, at least from its inception, a hyperfatal disease. Now, I bring that up to you because then I'm talking to the nurse, and she's like, you know, it's the most treatable kind of leukemia, no problem. And I'm thinking, no problem, hyperfatal. Hyperfatal sounds like a problem to me. So I asked her about that, and she said, well, she said, you know, and, you know initially they didn't know how to treat it, but she said, you know, the, the first day, few days can be dicey, but, you know, once we get them stabilized, it, it, sh it, it, it should be no problem, very treatable. I went up, I did my speaking, called that evening, you know, everything was still pretty much the same. I said, fine, I'll check back in in the morning. Now, I was still a little bit worried. I didn't know, you know, I mean, everything we're hearing says things are just the tests and stabilizing and good. And so I talked to somebody at the camp meeting and asked him to cover for my speaking on Sabbath, just in case. And I said, I'll check in in the morning and, and see how things are. When I called in, it was the same old, hey, you know, we're just, things are, have, nothing's changed, things are good, and we're working on tests and what have you. Okay, fine. My dad was coming in from California, so I went up, I did my speaking engagement, I came back from that, now it's again, it's an hour and a half north from, from where the hospital was, I come back, I pick up my dad at the airport, and I head over to the hospital. This is Sabbath afternoon. I get to the hospital just in time for the report to come where the doctor said, you know, we're doing everything we can, but there, there may come a point where we can't do anything else. And I'm thinking, what, <laughs> what are you talking, you know, this, this is, in fact, I had just talked to my brother Jim, who was there as well, 
just before this about like how long, I mean, how long should I take off of work? We're thinking, we don't even have a, a, an idea yet. Maybe, I mean, what is promyelitic? Leukemia, what do they, or acute promyelitic leukemia, is it like, uh, do they give you six months to live, two years to live, do we, I mean, what do we, what plans do we make? Nobody's thinking anything is going to be more drastic than that, and that's drastic enough. And now they come in and they're like, there may be a point, there's nothing else we can do. So I, my brother Jim and I, my dad, my mom, some others that were there, got together, about ten of us, in the, one of the family rooms, and we had a season of prayer and we put it in the Lord's hands. And no sooner had we said amen than the doctors came in and said my brother coded, uh, flatlined, and they lost him. On the table. This was less than 48 hours. My brother had no illness he didn't have a pre-existing condition we didn't know about. He was playing tennis with his son a week earlier. He was 56 years old. I'm 52 years old. And he was gone. And I couldn't help but think back to this Christmas. And the Lord laying on my heart, and I put it off because I didn't want to sound preachy, you hear what I'm saying this morning? I mean, the Lord tells us to redeem the time. We, we, our, our profession is evidence. Say the Lord's coming soon. Oh, yeah, yeah, we all sing songs about it. We say that time is short, and yet there are people we know right in our circle of influence. And what are we waiting for? We don't want to sound preachy. Brothers and sisters, it's time to redeem the time. I did the funeral for my brother. I spoke and conducted the funeral. I've seen this happen before, but it really impacted me with my brother. How many wonderful things were said about my brother when it was too late for him to ever hear them. Like I say, I know that happens at funerals and people get up and they say, like, we're saying all this wonderful stuff that, oh, that we would have said those things when they were still with us. I heard things and I thought, oh, if my brother could have only heard that kind of thing, but we wait until somebody's gone and then we start to say all the things, well, I meant to say this. How many people do we know here, that we still have an opportunity to say those things to now. Then, brothers and sisters, let us redeem the time. Let us redeem the time. I am never, ever, 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 going to have the opportunity to influence my brother for eternity again. Now, I believe my brother will be in the kingdom, and I hope, especially in light of this, that there wasn't something that I left unsaid that would have been a determining factor. But you understand that once this life is over, there's no soul winning in heaven. It's done. Here and now is the time that we can use our talents and our opportunities, our money, our possessions, and all what the knowledge that we have. Now is the only time that can ever be used to help somebody into the kingdom. And I guess I could ask myself why we delay. And as I've mentioned, I kind of know the answer. We sometimes worry about being preachy, but there are other reasons. We feel inadequate. We feel we're going to mess something up by saying something. Brothers and sisters, the Lord would not have given us the Great Commission if he thought we were going to mess it up. God is in charge of the work, and he's just pleading with us to use our talents to win souls to the kingdom. I want you to notice this statement 
that is, was written in the Review and Herald of April 21, 1896, says, you may fold your hands saying, I'm only a lay member of the church. It is a hopeless task for me to undertake, that is to share my faith with others. Sometimes we feel very inadequate. I'll tell you, pastors do too. But have you yoked up with Christ is the question. See, when you yoke up with Christ, he carries the burden, he'll make it happen. We don't need to worry if we're yoked up with Christ when we go and share him with others. It says, are you laboring in his way? Oh, let it no longer be a source of grief to the heavenly intelligences and to him who has paid such an infinite price for souls that you refuse to be channels of light, that you refuse to cooperate with the heavenly agencies for the salvation of souls. But let us awake out of sleep and put all our God-given abilities into the work that it may be written in the books that we are redeeming the time because the days are evil. And I love this, this next statement here that I'll finish with. Oh, the statement finishes this way. If we keep our talents inactive, we lose all ability to make use of them. Look at this statement here. Christ's Object Lessons, page 373. This is on the chapter that is relating to the parable that we just looked at. It says, every year... This is not the one I want to look at, though. This is the one I want to look at. He who follows Christ's plan of life will see in the courts of God those for whom he has labored and sacrificed on the earth. Gratefully will the ransomed ones remember those who have been instrumental in their salvation. Precious will heaven be to those who have been faithful in the work of saving souls. Think about that for a minute. If we use the talents that we have, whether there are a lot of talents or just a few talents, but we use what we have in trying to lead someone to Christ, and that someone is in the kingdom, what joy can compare to that, when we are there with that, in that everlasting habitation, that's what the parable is saying, we're making friends through the mammon of unrighteousness, through the means that we have on this earth, and those friends will be with us in eternity, and how grateful they will be that we said that something, that we risked being preachy, if that's what it took, that we cared enough to reach them for the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, I believe the Lord wants to do great things for us and through us. This week, beginning tonight, we're going to be presenting various ways you can put your talents to use in reaching someone for Christ. Saints, I'm going to tell you right here and now, and I'm going to guarantee you that you can make an impact that will lead somebody to the kingdom. And some people say, well, how can you make a guarantee like that? Simple, because the Lord's already guaranteed it. And Here's the thing. The Lord is going to take what we have. You know, one of my favorite statements is in the book Education, and it says this. It is in the water and not on land that men learn to swim. Isn't it true? There's all kinds. You can theorize all you want, but listen, the point is this. When we step out and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you, and I'm just going to do what I can to share Christ with my friend, my family member, whoever, my coworker, the Lord will take that and teach us just like getting in the water and swimming will teach us. The Spirit of God will enable us to do what God has invited us to do anyway. So we want to focus this week on what we can do to put our talents to use in reaching someone for Christ and that someone may even be a church member but somebody who's spiritually struggling to keep their head above water and the Lord may just use you to be an instrument in his hands to put their feet on solid ground. Wouldn't you want to be, don't you want to be a part, if in any way possible, for somebody to find Christ and be in the kingdom of God for eternity? I know I do. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Father, as we have considered these things today, as we consider this parable of Jesus, Lord, may it come to us as an invitation, not a condemnation. Lord, you've told us in your word that all ten virgins fell asleep. 
And we don't know that that steward was trying to be dishonest, but the time came when he had to wake up and look at the things of eternity. Oh, Father, Father, help us to awake out of sleep and help us not to be so caught up in the things of this world that we forget or fail to put our talents to use in reaching souls for your kingdom. And Lord, I know you want to use each one here in a mighty way, and I pray even now you would speak to our hearts and minds, put names in our hearts and minds of people that are in our circle of influence we can reach for your kingdom. And then, Lord, do through and for us what we can't do for ourselves. We thank you for loving us, for saving us, and for promising to use us to save others. And we ask and pray these things in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. I want to invite you to turn to the hymn of response, I'll Go Where You Want Me to Go, number three, I'm sorry, number 573.
Let's bow our heads together. Oh, Father in heaven, Father, we want to be what you want us to be. So we look to you again to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. Oh, Father, may the love and the light of Jesus shine through us to others that they may know that we have been with him. Bless us now through the remainder of these Sabbath hours, for we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.